I really wanted to close with uh, the battle for our community. There's some things that go on in our community that sometimes we're not aware of because we're kind of caught in a bubble and we don't see them as clearly. But when I moved to this community as a newbie, how many of you know when, when you're new, you notice stuff? Amen? When you're new, you pick up. It's just like um, when someone has a pet and they don't care for that pet as they should and they don't care for their home as they should and you notice that pet smell when you walk in, right? And they live in it and they don't notice it, right? It's like it's not there. They're so used to it. And that's what happens in a community sometimes. It's when you live in a community and you've grown up there, you don't see the things that work in that community like someone who is new would. And when I first moved to Hardin County, I recognized some struggles that I had never faced before. And, I, you know, I had faced battles in different communities that I'd lived in. But when I moved to Hardin County, I was like, there is something different about this place. There is something strong working against this place. And I really spent the last several weeks teaching to really build to this point. Um, to make it clear that there are evil rulers, there are authorities, there are powers at work in the air. Which hopefully, um, if you've caught all this series, you're up to speed. If you haven't, then it may be a good idea to go on YouTube and watch the rest of Breaking Through Strongholds. Um, this would be the fifth part of it. Technically the fourth, because remember, the, the three part I had to break into two weeks. But Satan has a strategy against God's people. He has a strategy against this planet. And just like man organizes and tries to move into territories and tries to gather into families, and just like God has order through the angels and through creation, Satan has an army that is orderly and that is unified and then his purpose is to attack and to destroy all the things that God created. Now, we know ultimately he will fail. Amen? But we do know that during the meantime, he's had some success. Because how does Satan work? He works through man. Right? Man not being gender, man being mankind. The same way God works, right? God works through man. I think it's in Ezekiel where it says, God said, and I looked for a man who would stand in the gap. See, God is looking for people to use. Is God capable of doing this thing himself? Absolutely. He proved it 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ. He's capable of doing it himself. But he set a plan in motion to use people. And that is why Satan is in the heavenly realms doing battle for the hearts of people. Because he knows if he can keep people distracted, if he can keep them frustrated, if he can keep them sick, if he can keep them fighting each other, if he can keep them politically motivated instead of kingdom motivated, then he can keep the church weakened. And I noticed, I noticed two things immediately when I moved to this county. Number one thing I noticed is the Pentecostal churches were not visibly Pentecostal. The number two thing I noticed is that sexual sin seemed to have its way in this area. I mean, immediately. I noticed those things immediately. Now, I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but I'm going to talk about a few things I'm tired of. I'm tired of seeing this community defeated, divided, and sick. I'm tired of cancer. I'm tired of drug addiction. I'm tired of fighting within. And I'm tired of defeat. I'm tired of seeing Pentecostal churches in this community weak. Can I ask you a question? Why is it only the non-Pentecostal churches that are bursting at the seams? Why are Pentecostal churches going through this same pattern? Growth, split, recovery, growth, split, recovery. What is the problem? What's going on? I'm tired of it. I'm tired of seeing Pentecostal churches not be able to get along with their own selves. Much less our brothers all across this community. And I'm not declaring that non-Pentecostals are not our brothers. If you call on the name of Jesus and you believe in his word, you're my brother, you're my sister. 
we may have some minor differences. We may have some major differences. But ultimately, there's only one name under heaven by which man can be saved, and it's not the assemblies of God. It is the name of Jesus. Amen? But I'm tired of seeing Pentecostal churches be the small ones in the communities. Another thing I'm tired of is I'm tired of seeing men and women waste their prime. I'm tired of seeing people in the prime of their life twiddle their thumbs and do things that don't matter, and then when they're at that place in life when they should be enjoying their legacy, they're living with a legacy of regret. I wish I would have. I'm tired of it. And as the lady on Facebook says, I ain't doing it. I can't make my face look like that live. But I am not wasting the prime of my life to build a legacy of regret. I'm tired of it. I am tired of pastors going rogue thinking they can do it alone. Forgetting that they need the fellow pastors in their community and their congregations to do what God has called them to do. I'm tired of it. And see, there comes a point where you get so tired of it that you don't live with it anymore. I'm tired of play like. Remember I talked about that last week. I'm tired of people playing church and pretending like there's not a real enemy out there trying to destroy us. We're going about through our day and worshiping and doing things, and there's no seriousness in who we are and what we are. We come to church, but we don't have our identity grounded in who Jesus is in us. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. And I'm not going to put up with it anymore. See, I'm 44 years old, and I am in what is considered to be the most productive decade of my life. Now, understand, you can be productive any decade, but typically your 40s, you are to, you're past the point of being a little kid, right? Nobody's patting you on the head saying, there, there now, young man, because you ain't a young man anymore. But then nobody's saying you're too old, right? Because how many of you have been told you're too old? Amen? Well, number one, that's a lie. As long as you got breath in your body, you aren't too old. However, the 40s is a decade, I will tell you, don't waste them. Don't waste them. And if you're younger than that, don't you dare waste them. Next week, I'm going to be reading out Ecclesiastes where it says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Because when you're old, it gets harder. Are you hearing me? While you're young. Next week is our Bible college graduates. I'm excited about it. But I want this to be my decade of awakening, so to speak. I want my 40s to be what it's supposed to be, where I've found who I am, where I've discovered what I want to do, and beyond being a pastor. I'm talking about my kingdom purpose beyond just preaching and teaching. I'm talking about taking territory from the enemy. I'm talking about winning battles the church has been losing for decades. I am sick of it. I'm sick of televangelists that embarrass us through their moral failures. And then, act, now I'm not against all televangelists. Don't get, I feel like I always have to explain myself. But you have to admit, the 80s was a rough decade for us. Amen? And television ministry is still recovering from that. I'm just sick of the church always having a black eye. I'm sick of lack of integrity in the pulpits. But it doesn't have to be this way. Now, Pastor, what in the world? Why are you talking about all this? I want to take you to Matthew chapter 12. Because I'm going to tell you why I think it's this way and how we can overcome it. Matthew chapter 12. These verses that I'm reading this week, you've been on them every week. So it should all be very familiar. Starting with verse 22. It says, then a demon oppressed man. Now, the word oppressed actually means possessed, because I went and looked it up. So a demon possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, being Jesus, and he healed him. So the man spoke and saw. Now, remember, when I first brought attention to this verse, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Number one, there is sickness that is spiritually related. It's an attack of the enemy. It's not physical. Amen? 
And then there is sickness and disease that is either chemically or physically related. It's something in your body that needs healing. Because what happens is if we're not careful, we try to cast the devil out of everybody. They got some sickness in their body, we're trying to cast demons out of them. Well, they may not have a devil. They may have a physical problem that they need healing with. Now, some of them, they may have a demonic oppression or a demonic possession on them that is keeping them from receiving that. So, please be careful. Pentecostals are the worst about casting devils out of everything. Amen? And sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes you just call it a cold. For real. You need healing. Now, some people need deliverance. And Pentecostals are also the worst about spirit of everything. If they attach a spirit to everything, because then it takes responsibility off me. Right? Well, I, I, I didn't commit adultery. The spirit of adultery got me. No, your flesh got you, sucker. Chill out, repent, and get yourself right. Now, do I believe there are spiritual forces at work that are tempting us? Of course I do. But don't blame the devil for everything. I heard an old joke one time, and you all know I'm really bad at telling jokes. I'm probably going to butcher this, but the devil was sitting on the street corner crying, and the old Pentecostal preacher walked up to the devil and sat down next to him in a moment of pity. And he said, devil, what are you crying about? And he said, the Pentecostals blame me for everything. I told you I was bad at telling jokes. <laughs> but is it not true? We tend to blame the devil for everything. When sometimes it's our own responsibility. So anyway, that was a side note, not part of the sermon. That was free. Moving on to verse 23. All the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Now, we've already talked about this, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, by whom did your sons cast them out? Ooh, boy, that's a zinger. Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it's by the Spirit of God, now listen to this, that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. So in this text, Jesus shows a few things which I've talked about before in this series. Number one, Satan has a system. He has an order. He has a plan of attack. The Bible says we're not unaware of his schemes. Because we noticed that Beelzebul was pronounced as a priest. Or I'm sorry, a, 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 a prince of demons. There was an order. He had a rank within this. The second thing that Jesus points out is that kingdom, the kingdom of Satan is not divided. It is very unified. And it has one purpose, the destruction of God's plan on man's life. There are no demons that are set up in denominations. Amen? Amen? They don't have different assemblies of different demonic academies that all have dis different agreements, disagreements, because they don't care. They have one mission, destroy mankind's purpose. And they have been extremely successful. Now, again, if you're a little bit lost, I do apologize. You're going to have to go back and check it out. That's one of the reasons I have a love-hate relationship with Ceres. But sometimes you just can't get it all out. Then the third thing that Jesus pointed out is that a stronger man had come and was able to bind him. Amen? Not only did he say it, but he displayed it by casting the devil out of that man to where he was able to see and to speak. So there's some powerful things that happen there. See, we have this tendency to either exaggerate Satan's power or act like he has none. And I'm here to tell you that both of them are very dangerous. We cannot exaggerate his power because it is all brought under the authority of the cross. However, we can't ignore it because it is there. We have to recognize who we are and who lives in us. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
So as I pointed out, Satan's kingdom is not divided. It's not set up in denominations. And even if it is, he doesn't care because as long as it's got one purpose, destruction of mankind and its purpose, then he doesn't care. But see, as Christians, we care about labels, don't we? If your label doesn't match my label, then I'm not going to have fellowship with you. And if you've got a slight little difference in what you believe than what I believe, then I can't have fellowship with you. In fact, pastor or somebody, if you don't shake my hand, if the greeters don't look at me just right, if you do something just a little weird in one of the services, then I'll just bounce from church to 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 church. And then sometimes I've seen them bounce right back in here. And it's like, whoa, there they are again after several years. And they just bounce and 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 bounce. But they never grow. See, folks, if you want to gain traction over a unified kingdom, you've got to have a unified kingdom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And it's got to start in this room. We've got to get on the same page. We've got to uh, express the same purpose. And one of the greatest ways that we express disunity in a local church setting like this one is spending more time building our own kingdom than we do building the kingdom of God. And that's really going to kind of be the theme of next week as well, or the week after next. I'm sorry, the week after next is the graduation. Um, but that's going to be the theme of next week and the week after as well, is putting God's things first. In the book of Haggai, God, uh, God tells the people, you're living in these mansions and my house lies in ruins. Well, we're not talking about physical buildings here. But is God's kingdom being advanced in the way that it should? Are we seeing revival in the churches like we should? Are we seeing the healings and the people being set free and the deliverances like we should? Then maybe it's possible that we're focused on our own kingdoms a little too much. And it's time for us to shift our allegiance to the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be worked out. And see, we have this attitude sometimes, don't we, that I need to work it out. Well, I need to take on extra hours, or I need to do this, and I need to do that. And look, I understand. There, there are situations in life sometimes we can't control, and we've just got to act according to it. But sometimes we are too fast to give in. It's just like, what's wrong with when you're going to a new job telling them, you know what, I can't work on such and such a day and such and such a day because I have commitments to the Lord. Amen? Maybe they'll work it out. But sometimes we don't even ask. Well, I need this job, so I might as well just take it. And I'm, you know, okay. Sometimes we don't even ask. It's time for us to recognize, I need to put God's kingdom first. Folks, if we're going to win the battle for this community, we've got to put the kingdom of God first. We've got to say, Lord, come what may, no matter what, I'm going to do what you I always call this turkey hangover Sunday. I swear, this is the quietest church after Thanksgiving that I've ever been to in my life. And it's got to be because of the turkey hangover. Y'all done had turkey for three days, and you just ain't feeling it. Well, I'm still feeling it, and I'm going to give it. But there's a battle over our community, and I believe there are demonic forces at work over our community that's trying to keep us exactly where we are and even worse off. Because, see, the Bible says the kingdom suffers violence, but the violence take it by force. See, the kingdom of God is meant to be advanced, not possessed, if that makes sense. I, and l let me define that. By possessing something, you sit there, you admire it, you look at it, and you say it's mine, but you don't really do anything with it. Right? But the kingdom of God is meant to be advanced. Folks, we're in a war. And we're in a war for this community. The book of Acts says God put you in the place that you live, in the time that you live, and gave you a purpose so that people could come to know him. Why do you live in Hardin County? Why do you live at your address? It's because you have an assignment, a kingdom purpose to overcome the enemy and advance God's kingdom wherever you live. God strategically places us in places where we can advance his kingdom. And if we're so caught up in hours and going to work and doing this, and we never establish God's kingdom outside of our own home, we just possess it. We admire it. 
Kind of like Gollum with his ring. My precious. But we never advance it. Then we're losing. Because the enemy is advancing, folks. The drug epidemic is getting worse. The political climate is getting worse. Sin is getting worse. We can't even define whether we're a man or a woman anymore because the problem is getting worse. Satan is advancing a kingdom, and the only way to stop it is to resist it and advance the kingdom of God. The church has been quiet and admiring for way too long. So with that said, I've talked a lot about strongholds. I've talked a lot about demonic forces. And I've talked a lot about the spiritual warfare that goes on in that place between heaven and earth, known as the second heaven, as we talked about last week. When I first moved here, I recognized something, but I need to back up a few years. This was somewhere around 2003, 2004, and I lived in a little town called Burksville, Kentucky. The whole county had 7,000 people, and it's about the same land mass as here. The town that I lived in had 1,700 people. It was little. It was boring. I'm talking about 8 o'clock. They rolled the sidewalks up. Nothing happened in Burksville after 8 o'clock. And when we're on this time, when it gets dark at 5.30, it actually got dark at 4.30 there because they're on slow time. They did everything slow in Burksville, including time. I loved those people. And I'm going to tell you what, those people were aggressive too. But there, there was a spiritual victory in Burksville because a church grasped its purpose. And then I came here, and I just felt something wasn't right. Never could put my finger on it, but I, just, I was like, something's not right with this community. Something is going on in this community. And then I began to do some research and started discovering some things but somewhere in 2003, 2004, to go back to that, I was falling asleep. You know what I'm talking about? But I wasn't asleep. And I was laying down, and I don't know that I was meditating or doing anything spiritual. And I had a vision. And in this vision, I saw a courtyard. And in this courtyard, there were hundreds, innumerable people. I don't know how many, but it was a bunch. And they were in a circle around this tall shadow, I'm going to call it. It looked like a shadow. And it had eyes that I could see. You know, they were bright, it was kind of red and glowing. And I walked up to this courtyard and saw all these people in horror as they were bowing to this thing. And I was like, what are they doing? So then it saw me, and it locked eyes with me, and I'm going to tell you what, some fear hit me. And then it looked at me, and it looked back down at the people, and it wanted to show me its dominance. So it would do this, and all of them would get up. It would do this, and all of them would bow back down, and it would just control them. And then it looked at me again, and I knew my assignment was to confront it for the sake of those people. And then I snapped out of it. And I was like, what in the world was that? So I went to my pastor. And I told, because there was no courtyard there. that They barely even had a school. The school had 170 students. I mean, it was, it was a tiny little community. And I, I was just convinced that God wanted us to do some warfare there. So I started trying everything. I had youth revivals and did all these things to try to help this vision come to pass. You know, I tried to play Abraham, you know. Try to help the vision come to pass. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to Genesis and read through Abraham and look at what he did and created the Ishmael. And I tried everything I could to help the vision come to pass. Well, then I was dismissed and the ministry, the youth ministry, was, was done away with. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do with that vision now? And I came here under duress. I did not want to come here. Um, I, I, there were several things I didn't like, uh, some... The pastor was one of them. We didn't get along beforehand. I just, I'd always had issues with him, just being real. And then, but I had a meeting with him, and we kind of hit it off, and I was like, you know what, maybe I had this guy all wrong. 
So we hit it off, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'll come work with you. And I came, and I sat in my office, and there was that thing again that just didn't feel right. And I was like, what is wrong? And so I began to do some research about the churches in this community. And then I found out in 1959, this church started and immediately split. And then I found out that the church that was developed from the split, split as well. And then this church split again. And then another Assembly of God church split from us, and it split. And I was like, what is going on? And then I noticed another thing. Every Assembly of God church in this community has been hit with a, with a moral failure, including this one. Where pastors have been stealing money or committing sexual sin. I know this is on the internet. And I, I, so what? I'm here to address a strong man. Because see, the Bible says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Now we know ultimately that's talking about Jesus, but we know that Jesus also has under shepherds. Why are the Assembly of God churches or the Pentecostal churches in this area weak? Now I can't speak for the churches of God in Christ and all these others. I'm talking about us. Okay, but the reason the Assembly of God churches in this area are weak is because the pastors keep failing. So I made a declaration. I'm not going to be one of them. I'm not going to be one of them. Amen. Well, then what happened? My pastor fell. We're being real as we can be this morning. That took me by surprise. There's only a few of us left that remember this. It took me by surprise. And the strong man had gotten my church. I wasn't prepared for that. So needless to say, a few years had passed, and I remembered something. Some years before that, I was going to a basketball game at Central Harden to watch a young girl named Christian Harper play basketball. Some of you may remember her. And I walked into that school courtyard, and I stopped. Because I remembered it. This was about four or five years after that vision. But I saw that courtyard, and I was like, this is the one. This is what I saw in my vision. So instead of getting before God and praying and fasting and seeking his face, I decided I'm going to volunteer at that school I'm going to do everything I can because this has got to be what God was talking about. And then I got in trouble, got kicked out of the school, caused all kinds of mess, and um, had students turning me in. It was hilarious. Remember Jacob? It was him! <laughs> it's like, shush! I was passing out Bibles, and Cletus, you know you can't do that in school. Um, I, was just, I was just helping them. You know? I, I didn't touch the Bibles. I just made sure they got a hold of them. And Boy, did I get in trouble. And I was just trying to advance the kingdom of God and do my best, but the strong man was in resistance to that. And I know I'm kind of jumping back and forth in time, and hopefully you're following me. But to go back to the moment when this, this strong man had gotten my church, because later, God revealed something to me. Because what had happened is, some folks wanted me to be the pastor, and some folks didn't. And I decided to go ahead and throw my hat in the ring, give it a shot, we lost. Things went bad, so I was moving. Put our house up for sale. Sayonara, hopefully it works out one way or another. There's nothing I can do about it. it, was in my mind. And then this guy came to me. We had a meeting in my office where I was basically declaring my own funeral. And this man said something to me. He said, there is a stronghold in this community that you are called to take on. And your assignment is not completed. And I thought the man was loony. I was like, I just got voted out. There ain't nothing we can do about that. Well, needless to say, I'm still here. It's a long story on how that happened. If you're interested, I'll tell you. But basically, the district intervened, and, and here we stand. Um, that is one good thing about being part of an organization is they can help you when you're in deep trouble. Amen? So after that day, I prayed and said, okay, God. <laughs> All these things that I did not expect happened. I knew something was wrong in this community when I moved here. Didn't expect it to hit my church. Didn't expect it to impact me in this way. And now I've been voted out. My, my sentence has been written. You know, what am I supposed to do here? And then that's when the phone rings and 
and the district's coming in, and the rest is history. However, God showed me with a little more clarity this strong man because I finally decided to do something. Elder Robinson, maybe I should seek the Lord about this thing. Instead of trying to do stuff, maybe I should ask him, Lord, what was this all about? Because I was finally confused. And he showed me something. He showed me five things that this demonic force was having success with in this community. And the first one was sexual sin. Lust. Perversion. And pastors had been falling prey to it, left and right. Because see, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Why are our Pentecostal churches so scattered? Well, because for decades in this community, the shepherds have fallen to the strong man. The second thing that he revealed to me was depression, addiction, and even more specifically, suicide. Did you know that in this community, we had a pastor that committed suicide? In this community, a pastor killed himself on Sunday morning. They found his body right before church. You want to talk about a devil on the loose? Folks, we have a problem, but I've got an answer. The third thing he showed to me was greed, a competitive spirit, and it specifically exists even within the churches, where churches view each other as competition rather than brothers and sisters. I'm going to be honest. The pastors get together once a month, we eat lunch, we talk about holidays that ain't even close yet half the time, and we don't accomplish a whole lot. I know it's on the internet, I'm sorry. But folks, we got to get to a place where we, we, we come together to advance some things. I, I remember when we did services together in Burksville. Two and three churches, the youth groups would get together and we'd do things together. Um, we'd have community fellowships together. We'd have, we'd have events together. And uh, I just didn't see that here. As a matter of fact, we used to do the, th- the Thanksgiving deal and nobody'd show up but us and First Baptist. You know, and it's like, what, what is going on? Why can't we come together? And in Louisville, I noticed even greater, we had sectional events where churches came together. And we don't see that here. And that's a problem because people are so afraid well, if I take them to this church, and they're going to steal my people, and this, that, and the other. And do you realize if people can be stolen, they were never yours? Amen? And then the next thing I noticed is any person that had any kind of success in ministry in this, com- in this community was worshipped. Exalted so high on a pedestal they couldn't stand on. And that led ultimately to their fall when they received that. Um, we, we had a prominent uh, evangelist from this community come, and this church was packed. And I'm like, y'all know Jesus is here every week, right? Did this person save you from your sins? And then the last thing is strife. Man, churches in this community know how to fight. We know how to fight with each other. We know how to fight with others. It's just ridiculous. There was actually, a in, within our youth group, there was another youth group in Radcliffe, and there was like this battle going back and forth with our youth group and their youth group, and they would not have fellowship with each other. We tried to do youth events. I ain't going over there with them. And it's like, are you kidding me? It was ridiculous, and it was all over somebody's girlfriend. Seriously, it was over a boyfriend and a girlfriend that broke up, and they were in rival youth groups. It's like, Wow. So I want to remind you of something. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. People are not our enemy. Folks, we've got to set our eyes on things above. That's what the Bible says. Amen? And when you set your eyes on things above, not only do you see Jesus exalted and powerful, but you see your real enemies. Those demonic forces that are at work in the heavenlies. We've got to get our eyes off man. The Baptist church is not our problem. The Episcopalian church is not our problem. 
The churches in Radcliffe and Rhineville and the rest of E-Town are not our problem. Satan is the problem. His forces are the problem. And this thing that has been dominating our community and keeping our churches weak is the problem. Now, remember last week I talked about, or week before I talked about principalities. And that is a demonic force that is given a territory to exist in and to try and dominate. And I believe that that principality is the reason that we've been having these battles, but he can't work without a man. Revelation chapter 3, just to give it quickly, every time Jesus wants to gain a foothold in a city, he addressed the pastor. Go back and read it. It says, to the messenger in Ephesus, to the leader in Ephesus. And I believe that's why God tried to get my attention back in Burksville is because he said, you're going to become a pastor. And I'm going to say, to the pastor of Lakeside, I have an assignment for you. Now, one thing I believe is I, can't, I, I believe, number one, I can't do it by myself. The reason I believe God didn't let me see whatever happened in that vision is because I didn't even understand what it was going to take at the time. Number one, it's going to take everyone here being on the same page. Amen. And number two is we've got to gain ground in bringing our churches together. Amen? Lakeside can't do this alone. Because what if Lakeside gets... Because here's another thing that's interesting, and then, then I'll wrap up. There was a church in Radcliffe that had almost 1,000 people. And then these things happen in succession. Bus crash, moral failure, embezzlement. I mean, it's back to back to back, because see, that strong man was like, no, I ain't having this. So I'm going to allow some things to happen that will devastate this congregation, and then I'm going to seize that moment to discourage their hearts and make them blame themselves and all these different things. And that church has never been the same. There's another Pentecostal church that rose up in this town that got to be almost 1,000 people. It's closed now. I don't even know what happened there. It makes zero sense. Folks, we're up against something strong, but Jesus said, how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man? So I'm here to say that God has called us to bind the strong man and plunder his goods. Because another thing I've noticed with people here in this community is they don't stay at a church very long. They bounce around, and it's just, and I think it's part of because they've been wounded. Okay, let, let's be real. How many of you have been hurt in a church in this community? And see, it's everywhere. And why? It's because there's a strong man that wants you to stay hurt so you won't get grounded and keep you in bondage. So every time you recognize that pain again coming back up because it's being addressed, and what's, your, what, what's the tendency? I got I to gotta go, I got to go, I got to go. I can't stay here. Folks, you eventually got to stay. You eventually got to tough it out. You eventually have to fight. You eventually have to say, this is my church. Come hell or high water, I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to do what God's called me to do no matter what. I'm going to win this battle because I refuse to give this strong man one more inch. It's going to take people that are willing to tough it out and say, I'm going to do whatever it takes. This is why I believe it's so important that this church does not lose its focus on impending revival. Folks, impending revival was, an event with, was not an event with cute t-shirts. It is an idea. It's a pursuit that we want nothing more than the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. There's victory. There's all these things. And we've got to be a church that corporately pursues his presence. Corporately believes that he can help people be set free. I'm going to read one last verse and, and, and do a quick close. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 through 11. 
Paul is talking about the purpose of the church. He says, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, listen to this, the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now, if you were here the last few weeks, you know those rulers and authorities in heavenly places are the demonic forces that are warring against the church in that second heaven between where God dwells and where we are. We're supposed to take over that place. How are we going to make God's uh, manifold wisdom known in that place unless we take it over? Are you hearing me? That's the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to clear out the second heavens so that people can have free access to the presence of God. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church's job is to overthrow the strong man by the authority of the Father, in the name of Jesus, and the power of the Spirit. So we have to recognize the battle that we're facing today is a spiritual battle. I feel like I am looking at a bunch of animals staring at a brand new gate wondering what's going on. And we're getting music. That works. <laughs> you never know what will happen at Lakeside. Music does help, though. So I hope I'm being clear. I feel like I gave a bunch of stuff. But I started with talking about how I'm tired of seeing this community defeated. I'm tired of seeing this community divided. I'm tired of getting text messages on Sunday morning saying, Pastor, I'm sick and I won't be able to be there. I'm tired of seeing Pentecostal churches that don't even look Pentecostal. I'm 44. And I want to see this broken before I'm 50. I want to see this broken before I'm 45. Folks, I'm tired of wasting time. I'm tired of seeing this thing advance while the church sits and admires what it has. It is time for us to recognize we have everything within us that we need in order to overcome this thing. But here's some things I believe it's going to take. Number one is we're going to have to pray privately and corporately. Okay, we talked about play like, remember that? I want y'all to play like something with me. Let's play like church starts at 930. Fill up the Sunday school classes, fill up the prayer room, and if nothing else, at least play like it starts at 1020. Get in this sanctuary for 10 minutes while Dr. Norm leads us in a prayer to prepare our hearts for receiving of worship. Most of us, can you imagine starting a car without any oil? All the clattering and chattering, and then eventually the, oil, the, the engine will seize up. Sometimes you got to get things oiled up so those pistons can get to moving. So spend 10 minutes. Now, the funny thing is, if some of y'all play like it starts at 1020, that means you'll get here at 1040 instead of 1050. And if you're late to service, I love you. I did not look back today because I knew I was going to be addressing this topic, and that way nobody can say he's talking about me. That's all I know is there's about 25 people here the first time I turned around. The second time I turned around, I was like, where did all these other folks come from? Folks, if we're, going to, uh, if we're going to advance the kingdom of God, then we've got to value time. Amen? So let's pretend we start at 930. And if nothing else, let's pretend we start at 10, 20. Get here at least 10 minutes early so that we can gauge and prepare the atmosphere. Oh, my goodness. Can you just imagine if people came oiled, lubricated with the pistons already pumping? And Lord, we want your presence. And all of a sudden at 9.30, the engine starts and it feels a little cold. But then by 9.40, things are starting to move and the spirit's starting to stir. And that strong man's thinking, oh no, they're starting to get it. And then day after day after day, we pray privately. 
and keep those pistons oiled and keep everything just moving and, 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 and ready. And then we come together at six on Wednesdays and we pray together again and we just keep it moving. And then we sit and listen and learn and interact over the word. And then Sunday comes again and we oil it up and wherever we are, we're getting ready. And something just begins to waken up in us. And by the time the service starts, there's an explosion of power. There's another thing that I believe we need to do on a regular basis, and that is fasting. Private and corporate. I think you should have private times to where you set aside to where, you know what, I'm going to go without food for the purpose of getting in God's presence and getting insight on how to advance His kingdom. But then there are times, a couple of times a year, we call for corporate prayer and fasting. This year it was around uh, the revival. Last year it was around the election. Another thing we need to do is worship, private and corporate. See, it's not enough just to worship at church. (laughs) If you're not worshiping at home, then how are you going to keep everything going? You know, I'm reminded of an old water pump. And if you don't prime that pump every now and then, what happens? That water dries up, doesn't it? And you've got to work yourself to death to get that thing back going. And that's how a lot of Christians live their lives. I'll just worship on Sunday. Prime that pump every day. Another thing is telling people about Jesus, evangelism privately and corporately. It is not just the church's responsibility to tell people about Jesus. It's every individual. You are part of the church. Amen? Reach your five. There are people in your community that don't know Jesus that you are called to reach. And folks, it is time for us to quit bottling up the message and begin to tell people about Jesus. The best way to reduce a stronghold's power is to reduce the amount of people it has access to by helping them come to know Jesus. Then the last thing is revival, private and corporate. And I tell you, we will not have corporate revival until we begin to have individuals walking in revival. When this stronghold is destroyed, and I did say destroyed because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, we have power to destroy strongholds. When this stronghold is destroyed in our community, I believe we'll see real change. I believe it will impact every church. And it'll unify every church. I believe the drug and alcohol epidemic will decrease. I believe depression, sickness, disease, and suicide will lose its grip. I believe sexual sin and its devastating effect on families will be greatly diminished. I believe selfishness will be decreased, and it'll be so big, no man will be able to take credit. No church will be able to take credit. I'm going to ask you to stand. In 2003, when I saw this strong man, I had no idea who or what it was. In 2007, when I saw the place, I still had no idea who or what it was. In 2009, when our church exploded and had all these issues, I still had no idea what it was until I saw it. Then he showed me what it was. And I've been fighting this thing since 2009. And I felt like it was time to release this to the congregation. Because it is time for us, corporately, to get this thing out. To destroy it. To defeat it. To beat it down. I do not want to lose one more marriage in this congregation. We've lost way too many. We've lost way too many people in this congregation because their marriages fell apart. I refuse to stand and allow that to happen. I don't want to lose one more person to addiction. I don't want to lose one more person to cancer. I don't want to lose one more person to that bouncing around because they refuse to deal with pain. I don't want that to happen anymore. I recognize who it is and what it is. And now I'm here to tell it and to tell you it's time for its grip over this congregation and over this community to end. We know who you are. 
we recognize your purpose. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Your reign is over. Your terror is over. And I believe that you are awakening pastors across this community to this very same thing. And whatever it is that you think you're going to do from this point forward, you are sadly mistaken in Jesus' name. Because a church is awake. A church is alert. A church is prepared. And a church is not unaware of your schemes. And we are ready to do battle with you. We are ready to pray. We are ready to fast. We are ready to win people for Jesus. And we are ready for revival. And we're going to worship like never before because we recognize it takes your knees out. While you are strong, you are weaker than who we serve. And we put you on notice. And every damage that you've committed to this community is going to be undone in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to gather together real quickly. Jesus. I love this song because there's, there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And see, maybe some of you, this strong man has wrecked even your home. Maybe drug addiction has visited your home. Maybe sickness has visited your home. Maybe greed has visited your home. Maybe even the worship of man has visited your home. Maybe strife has visited your home. I am here to tell you, Satan, you cannot have one more of our teenagers. You cannot have one more of our children. You will not divide one more of our families. You will not set one more set of parents at odds against their children. You will not have one more step, one more inch, any more ground. We are calling you out and we are telling you, you have already, we don't have to defeat you. You got defeated 2,000 years ago. We just recognize it today. Your word says whatever we bind in heaven will be bound on earth. And whatever we loose in heaven will be loosed on earth. Because we are your church. Your word says all authority has been given unto me. Now therefore go. So Lord, we know that you have all authority and we're called to go to advance your kingdom. To make disciples. To teach them to obey. To rid the enemy of any occupants to take over. So we recognize our place. We recognize our place. In Jesus' name. Now what I want you all to do is something different than we normally do. I want you all to gather up in small groups of about 10. Just find 8 or 10 people, gather up in groups, and I want you all to begin to pray for each other. If you've got a need, something you need prayer over, then I want you, the Bible says to share your burdens with one another. Amen? So this guy, and if you're not comfortable doing this, and just, 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 just humor me. But just come together with some folks. It can be people you're familiar with. Just gather up in circles, and let's just begin to pray. And then when you're done praying, you can consider yourself dismissed.
心。